So qu quick, uh, quick question. Does anybody know what movie poster this is? That's exactly right. Somebody said it. Esophageal Stenting, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. That's the second best title. The first best, I have to give credit to, to my uh, loquacious colleagues from the University of Pennsylvania. All that stents well does not end well. <laughs> I like that. So I have no disclosures. Um, so <clears throat> in talking about this, I want to set this up a little bit in talking about esophageal stenting in general. And this is not a new concept. It goes back a long way. Generally, there's a revival when there's new biomaterials available, not ivory and silver at this point in our life. But certainly in the 90s, um, there began to be a lot more use of stents because they were easier to put in, and they did offer some, some good qualities. These are most of the available stents now. The second one from your left, the Polyflex, is now off the market, but the rest of those are available. And uh, the general indications for these, malignant and benign dysphagia, and then two newer ones, perforation and an astomotic leak. So why use them in the first place? They, they do offer some advantages if used in the right context. Um, they're great for palliation. They are less invasive than other treatments. Sometimes they offer shorter recovery time. And as you'll see an example of, they don't delay chemotherapy or radiation. But they have disadvantages. They have a high revision rate. <clears throat> they have a moderately high medium range failure rate. And they can result in some devastating complications if used incorrectly that we'll talk about due to the radial force and the cardiac and mediastinal movement. And so this is a study that we did about four or five years ago, um, looking at a comparison multi-institution of folks who had stents versus operative repair for an acute perforation. And you see that stents do com uh, compare favorably, again, if used correctly in the right selected patients. Uh, most of these um, uh, outcomes do compare favorably, and for those of you that care about cost, cost also compared favorably to stents. And that included any time you had to go back to the operating room for a revision. So, so I think there is a reason to use them. And then a, a later paper where we looked at uh, salvage stent therapy for, for uh, operative repair that went on to leak, uh, something uh, brought up by the group at Emory. And again, good outcomes if used appropriately. But like any treatment, if used inappropriately or sometimes, unfortunately, if used appropriately, there are some complications that can happen. This is something that we've uh, now done uh, several times, looking at folks with a perforation associated with a malignancy. And in this particular uh, instance, I think it can have some value as well. You can see this is the uh, wire going through the perforation and the malignancy, and then this is the follow-up. The stent's been removed after chemotherapy and radiation therapy in a non-operative patient, an 86-year-old patient who would not have withstood traditional therapy. So they do have some uses. But let's talk about why we're really here, and that's the show and tell of all the bad things that can happen. Generally, the complications from esophageal stenting are divided into early and late at about the two-week mark, 10 to 20% early complica complication rate, and up to almost 40% late complication rate. The one that we see the most uh, early is pain and reflux. But you can have early erosion. Uh, it's, it's unusual, but you can see it. Late, you're often looking at migration, stent fracture, obstruction and tumor ingrowth in the malignant folks. And then the two complications we'll spend most of the rest of the talk uh, discussing, which is erosion into the airway or into a vascular structure, the ones that really ruin your day and, and, and do not leave you with a good feeling most of the time. So this is a meta-analysis done in 2018, looking at the complication rate of stents broken down by indication. The thing that's interesting about this table, I think, is that for almost all the potential complications except stent migration, the complication rate is higher in folks with malignancy, right? And so that's something to keep in mind when you encounter one of these complications, as we'll talk about in a second. But uh, in general, the stents are in those folks longer, and as we'll see, that seems to be important. 
So let's talk about aortoesophageal fistula. These came along before stents, and I'm sure there are folks in the room who've seen these. Um, the two that were first reported were related to transthoracic, um, or excuse me, intrathoracic um, leak after esophagectomy. Um, those two reports were in 1947. Um, so these have existed before stents were used. The first reports of folks having these complications related to stents began in the 1990s, again, when stents had a resurgence, especially in malignant dysphagia. Um, they um, uh, often uh, would erode into vascular structures, and the success rate was not good in treating them. Here's an example. As you can see, um, on your left, a CT scan, and on your right, an arteriogram uh, showing the leak into the esophagus where there is a stent deployed. So this is not obviously a great picture that you want to see in any of your patients. Here's a CT scan that's 3D reconstructed showing erosion into the carotid artery as well. Um, a review done um, in the uh, early 80s uh, showed uh, 81 cases in the literature, most of which were not related to stents, um, and a 100% mortality rate at that time. The first successful operation for this problem where the patient was able to leave the hospital was in 1980. The other one that concerns most of us is erosion into the airway. <coughs> um, these uh, occurrences seem to be more frequent in patients with malignancy. A history of radiation to the mediastinum or double stenting, where you stent the esophagus and the airway, uh, that used to be more common with some of our interventional pulmonologists and gastroenterologists. They're generally classified by location, either central or peripheral, and size less than or greater than five millimeters. So anything you do can have a complication, but you're less likely to have a complication if you have a plan. I don't think anybody in this room would go to the operating room without a plan based on best practice and based on evidence. Well, the same would go for a stent. And this is an algorithm that we use in our practice. It's been published. It's out there. Um, I think that if you don't have a plan, you're just going to put a stent in, especially as a surgeon, and then have someone else follow the patient. Maybe you're not seeing them regularly. You're not checking up on them. You're not involved in their care. That's, at least in our experience, where we start to see these kind of complications happen. So. With any, like with any other treatment, have a plan. And again, as we start to talk about treatment, the best treatment is prevention, right? Here, this is some work that we published about three years ago where we looked at complications of patients who had stents put in. We broke this up by either anastomotic leak on the left or acute perforation treatment. And we found breakpoints, at least in the population that we looked at. Anastomotic leak, the break point was two weeks. If you could get the stent out in two weeks or less, you had a 50%, uh, excuse me, 56% reduction in the complication rate. On the acute perforation side, if you could get the stent out in four weeks or less, you had a 39% reduction in the complication rate. And so, again, the best treatment for this condition is prevention because most of the treatments are very difficult to have success with. So choices of treatment and factors to consider. Because a lot of these folks have a stent put in because they're not an operative candidate in the first place, at least in our practice, or you're palliating somebody for malignancy, you have to really think about the overall patient, their functional status, and their long-term outcome aside from the stent and the complication. So we always try and take a deep breath and think about that prior to rushing in. The other things to consider, obviously, are prior radiation therapy or prior surgery, because they can greatly complicate your life if you're going to do an operative repair versus something else. The first thing to try and consider is the urgent or emergent treatment of these two conditions. Um, in the case of erosion into a major vascular structure, the obvious thing you try to do is control the site of bleeding. Much easier said than done because these are often 
uh, proximal uh, descending thoracic aortic injuries, which is hard to control. Um, but there are some endoscopic balloons that you can put in if you have the time. Um, in temporary intravascular occlusion through your IR folks, and we found that to be helpful. Or emergent surgery if you can get the patient to the operating room very, very quickly. We are fortunate, as I'm sure most of you are, to have some hybrid operating rooms with uh, imaging and fluoroscopy all built into the tables. That's a great room to take these patients to because your IR friends can come up and help. You can do endoscopy with fluoro all on the same bed. Um, but again, this is much easier said than done. On the airway side, if you can, keep the patient breathing spontaneously if they're able to ventilate and oxygenate. If they are not doing well, then you have to take control of the airway, intubate and ventilate. Um, contralateral mainstem intubation, a Carlin's tube or a bronchial blocker are very helpful in this situation if you have a sizable central fistula. Consider putting a peg in also so that you don't fill the stomach with air that you can't release and you really don't want to be placing nasogastric tubes blindly. And often you can stent the airway or the esophagus temporarily to get the patient enough time to get to the operating room or at least discuss with them what you'd like to do if, if uh, they are able to do that. So that's the emergent urgent side. There are some articles recently reported, an old, uh, an old treatment, the Sengson Blakemore tube for occlusion of vascular injuries. It works obviously if it's very distal, which most of these injuries are not, but it has been reported. So the more definitive treatment. Again, consider the patient. Some of these folks, you'll have a discussion with them about palliative care or hospice because their long-term outcome is not uh, good. Uh, beyond the current complication. If that is not the case, then on the aortic side, um, you can repair the aortic injury. It often requires cardiopulmonary bypass. If it's in the descending aorta, you can do left heart bypass through the left chest and put it in an air position graft, much like you're doing a transection. There's a lifetime risk of infection, obviously. Um, but that is an option. The, the method that we've had some success with is T-bar, um, and I'll show you a slide about that here in just a second, but um, the thoracic endovascular aortic repair offers a little more rapid control without the surgery, um, still obviously have the risk of infection. What do you do with the esophagus? Um, remove the stent is a good start. You can do a primary repair with muscle interposition, although we've had the most success with just doing a fairly rapid esophagectomy and coming back another day to worry about um, reconnecting. Uh, because in this particular case, you're, you're simply trying to save the patient often. Here's an example of a T-bar. On the left, you see the, um, the leak from the aorta. Um, on the upper right, you see the thoracic endograft, which has been placed. And in the lower picture, you see the operation, um, the operative picture going in to do the esophagectomy, and you can actually see the uh, part of the endograft to the aorta there. So um, we have found that esophagectomy seems to be the most rapid way to deal with the esophagus in these patients. On the airway side, most commonly, the airway defect is treated with a stent. The esophagus is not. Remove the stent um, unless you're, again, in a palliative mode. You can double stent these patients and get them to hospice if that's what is most appropriate. If not, primary repair with uh, muscle is uh, an option for the esophagus or esophagectomy. I think we're 50-50 in that camp of the, of the ones that we've taken care of. Obviously, for benign disease, operative repair remains an option for patients who, are, uh, who have a good functional status for an esophageal airway fistula. Challenges is that many of these patients have had radiation to the mediastinum for this or something else, which is how they ended up in this, in this case. And these fistulas are often broad-based, and so they are very difficult sometimes to close, especially in an airtight fashion. We have had a couple of cases where we were able to use ECMO, both in the repair and then postoperatively for a few days so that they didn't have positive pressure ventilation after surgery, or at least we were able to minimize that. 
So in conclusion, esophageal stenting is associated with complications, including erosion to the aorta and the tracheal bronchial tree. We've had a couple of these cases. Dr. Blackman reported on a case in one of her series. I've heard from several of you out there that you've seen these. So they, they do occur, and uh, unfortunately, they are not extremely rare. The management begins with avoiding them. Um, have an algorithm for how you approach these patients. We generally recommend getting the stent out at two weeks if it's an anastomotic leak and at, at four weeks or less if it's an acute perforation. That seems to be the break point for what we've been able to look at. Avoid stacking stents. So you've heard of people stacking uh, one or two stents in the esophagus. I think it's kind of analogous to the cardiology full metal jacket, right? That seems to increase your chances. And avoid double stenting of the airway in the esophagus at the same time. The treatment, we think that TVAR is, is a great asset in the aortoesophageal fistula. We like to combine it with esophagectomy. Um, but some of those patients are obviously palliative care or hospice patients. The airway fistulas, um, the airway is often easily stented and allowed to heal and esophagectomy or esophageal repair. Um, the repair of some of the complex fistulas may require ECMO uh, for the procedure or postoperatively. And again, palliative care and hospice. Thank you very much.